Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Um, you can unmute yourselves if you'd like. We have a small group today. So uh, thought we could make it a little bit more interactive. All right, let's see. Got about two more minutes till we're scheduled to start. So I think we'll just wait for um, the other attendees that were uh, that had registered. Um, in the meantime, I'd, I'd like to just ask you know who you are, where you come from, what your position is. Um, why don't we start with you, Rick? Rick, can you hear me? How about you, Ron? Hey there, uh, Ron Washburn. Oops, I'm sorry, but I, I, for some reason my thing is off. Okay. And I'm an, assist, I'm an assistant manager over at Le Limo in uh, Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Okay. All right, how long have you been there? Um, three years now. Three years, have you been in, in a management, management role the whole time? Nope, nope, probably about uh, three months there. Oh, okay, great. So this, yeah. you are the person this training is designed for. Cool. Ideal, ideal. And Sergio, how about you? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sergio Soto. I am the safety manager for Hercules Forwarding, and we're based out of Vernon, California, basically a suburb of Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, how long have you been in a management role there? Um, for this company, I've been here for 13 years. Oh, okay. Yep. So a newcomer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. And uh, Rick, are you there? Okay, well, maybe Rick isn't, is too shy to talk. So we'll, uh, let's see, we're right at two o'clock and I wanna be respectful of your time. So um, let me get going. Um, my name is Sherry Heller. I am a senior HR partner here at uh, MP. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we are a, a full service human capital management service company, and we offer a suite of products and services that include payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance. Uh, we offer our clients uh, with cutting edge, we offer our clients cutting edge technical uh, solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and uh, deep HR and payroll knowledge. Uh, MassPay is wired for HR, and we really do try to help our clients succeed by tying their business goals uh, to their operations. Uh, so with that, and that's me. And let me go from here. I'm going to actually stop sh uh, stop my video because it tends to sometimes bog down the, uh, the uh, training. And we are being recorded. Uh, so that way I can, we can send the link out to the, um, to the association, anybody who wants to view this afterwards. Uh, and at any point, since we're such a small group, um, don't, you don't have to bother chatting in questions. Just unmute yourself, jump in and say, Sherry, I have a question. Uh, so um, legal disclaimer, we always have one of these at the beginning of any training because we do talk a lot about employment law, but we aren't attorneys. Uh, we do this from an HR perspective uh, and we don't want anything to be construed as legal advice. All right, so let's get into this. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, so this particular training is really designed for uh, people who are either new to management, have been or have been promoted from within, um, and so maybe didn't have a lot of management experience when taking the position. Um, and then for those of you who are experienced managers, it's a great training tool for you to take back to your the people who report to you, the managers or supervisors who report to you. So we're going to talk about succeeding as a new manager, how to define your role. We'll talk a little bit about management style, uh, 10 of the most common mistakes that we see managers make, or new managers, excuse me, learning to delegate, which is probably when you're transitioning from an individual contributor role to a uh, management role or supervisory role, learning to delegate is one of the toughest things to do. Um, we'll also talk about managing former peers, which is uh, for those of you who have been promoted from within, you know that challenge, and then some tips for first-time managers. 
So um, according to uh, management guru, Peter Drucker, uh, he's written all the, uh, the books on management, been around for decades and decades. There are five basic functions in the work of a manager. Uh, managers first and foremost start set objectives and goals. Uh, they have to organize, motivate, and communicate to their teams, measure performance, and then also develop their staff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, according to Paul Hawken, a good management is the art of making problems so interesting and their solutions so constructive that everybody wants to get to work and deal with them. And I know that sounds sort of like pie in the sky, but it really isn't. Um, you know, uh, we at MassPay really sort of embrace this sort of philosophy because when we are uh, trying to resolve an issue or maybe come up with a new uh, um, offering to clients or whatever the case may be, we really kind of put it out there and we bring in people from all different areas of the company to work on these projects yes. so that all voices are heard. And it really makes people really want to contribute. All right. So whether you're managing a small team or an entire department, your concerns are generally uh, pretty much the same. Uh, can I still perform as an individual while being responsible for the contribution of others? Uh, will the transition from team member to team leader cost me my friendships? Um, have I got what it takes to motivate others and, to earn, earn their respect? And what if the team doesn't like me or uh, worst case scenario, they don't like each other, uh, which gets uh, can get a little hairy. So the first step a new manager really needs to take, or again, even if you're not a new manager, these are things that if you haven't done this before, it's a great opportunity to do so. Um, it's really important to understand your responsibilities and goals and ob objectives of your role. So first, you want to review your job description and, and use it to develop a plan that will turn objectives into actionable items. And what I mean by that is that if your job description uh, is, let's say, for example, uh, in your role, scheduling is part of your job description and it maybe isn't something you have a lot of experience in, that might, you might turn that into an objective for yourself to uh, develop those skills. Um, you wanna speak to your boss about their your primary objectives and responsibilities. You really wanna understand it from their perspective um, and then talk to the people you'll be managing. How do they see your role? What kind of guidance do they need? Um, I do recommend that even people who are currently in management roles, um, you can actually do this um, even, even now. Like you finish up this training and you say to your team, listen, I just finished up this great training. I learned a lot of new skills and I really want to start employing them. So uh, we're going to really talk about uh, really what you need from me and what I'm expecting from you. So meeting with your immediate supervisor, you want to gain clarity on communication. How often and about what, what's their preference? Do they want to be, do they want you to text them? Do they want you to call them? Do you want, e they want email? Do they want you to run? What about decision-making? Do you have to run every decision by them? What is your level of authority? Really important to understand or, or have a good handle on that. Um, I usually say that at the beginning, over communicate and then leave it to your boss to say, you know what, you don't need to run that by me on a regular basis. I trust your judgment. Um, you want to assess, do an assessment of your area. Uh, talk to your supervisor about that. What's their impression of the strengths and weaknesses in your area, uh, areas for improvement? Um, and then what, what, your, what your immediate supervisor's goals are for your area the specific goals and the time frame for each of those goals. So if you haven't done that to date, this is a great opportunity to uh, jump in and do that. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, we are gonna send out a copy of the slide deck at the end of the presentation, along with a link to the recording. All right, so typically when I'm doing this uh, session live, we do an exercise called what is your management style? Um, uh, we're, we're not going to do that in this webinar format, but I am going to send out to you a copy of that management style survey just so you can get a handle on where you fall in this spectrum. So, you know, it, it, there are so many different takes on management style, but the three most common management styles uh, are uh, autocratic or authoritarian, uh, democratic or participative, 
um, and what they call laissez-faire or free reign. Hang on, I just saw a question pop in. Uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. So uh, is that Rick? Hi, Rick. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, Hi, Sherry. Thank you. Yep. Good. I thought you were just being shy. Yeah, no, I've never been called shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good. All right. So um, one of the first lessons in managing people is that each person or department or group is unique and they really require a different supervisory approach. So ideally, we want to be able to pivot the style that we use based on the person or the department we're supervising. But it's also very common for managers to have a more dominant style. And it's really important for you to be aware of that because if you're working with a group that maybe is uh, works better with a more democratic style, but you're a little more hands-off, laissez-faire, um, you're gonna wanna sort of change your approach a little bit. There we go. All right, so this is a survey I'm gonna send out. Um, and it's got instructions on how to score it. So you'll be able to kind of determine what what, what your primary uh, management style is. So now let's talk about each of these management styles. So for the autocratic style, um, most of the decisions are made by the manager. There's no involvement or input from employees in decision-making. The manager just sort of informs their subordinates of what has to be done, how it has to be done, and when it has to be completed. And they're likely to ignore suggestions from staff. Now, this, does, this doesn't always sound like a nice way, nice thing to do, but this management style is useful in certain circumstances. So when quick decisions are needed, you don't necessarily, you know, when there's a, when there's a, um, a, a vehicle that's broken down um, and it needs, and, and you know, you've got customers, the clients in that vehicle, you don't really need to get a consensus on what to do. You need to sort of jump into action, right? Um, sometimes there's just no need for, for input um, and team agreement isn't necessary. Um, and also when there's a high level of management control needed. So in certain types of, of uh, certain aspects of your job, you may need to be a little bit more hands-on and more controlling of the situation than you would in other circumstances. So that's the, um, I guess, the useful side of the autocratic system, uh, management style, but there really are a lot of limitations to it as well. Uh, employees can't question uh, decisions, this little opportunity to give instructions, and it may negatively affect creativity and motivation. So it can really kind of squash people's enthusiasm for their job if they don't get to really be an active participant. Um, then there's the democratic style. Um, some decision making powers are given to mm -hmm. the group. Um, the manager still has final say in the decisions, and employees have an opportunity to provide their opinions and recommendations. So um, this sounds like a nice way to go, and it is for many reasons. Uh, first, uh, one useful uh, uh, democratic, democratic management style is very useful when team agreement is needed. When you're making a decision and you want to make sure that everybody is uh, on board, getting that, that team to agree to it will really help you roll something out. Um, greater motivation and commitment. And um, if you have knowledgeable and skilled team members, you're really utilizing their skill. But conversely, uh, there are some limitations. It is a time consuming process. So when a decision needs to be made quickly, um, again, that say, again, that broken down vehicle uh, with your customers in it, um, you know, trying to do it a democratic way probably isn't the most efficient. Um, and the decisions may take longer to implement. But in many cases, it's a great way to go, especially to, again, to roll out changes. Let's say you have a change to dress code, for example. People are used to being able to you know, maybe wear whatever they want, and you decide that you want them in uh, dress slacks with you know, a company uh, polo shirt. Sometimes getting the feedback from the team on this will really help you fine tune that policy and make sure everybody. So sort of hello, Dina. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Does somebody have a question? No. Okay. Um, oh my God. Okay, let me take it. Uh, okay, I'll take it. Okay. 
Um, then there's Just the Lady Fair Management <clears throat> now. Let's see who's who. Hello. Who? My name's Sergio. How can okay. I help you? Yeah, I just muted him. Okay, good. Okay, there thank you. There we go. <laughs> oh, okay, good. There we go. Good. Uh, yeah, sometimes <laughs> that's the, the the trouble with Zoom and webinars. Um, all right, so then there's a laissez-faire or free reign management style. Um, it's a really relaxed management style, and it takes a very hands-off approach. Um, in my particular role as an HR partner, my manager, who is the VP of HR Solutions, uh, HR Services, is very hands-off. Um, it's a very relaxed management style. It gives complete decision-making control to the staff. Uh, employees decide how to manage their workload, and managers don't closely oversee what employees do, um, which in our capacity, this is really handy. If I had to run everything by my boss in order to assist my clients, um, he'd be overwhelmed and I wouldn't get much done. He has the um, confidence in his team that we understand what our job is, what our level of authority is to make decisions, and then we know when to loop him in uh, if needed. So a laissez-faire type management style is good when you have a really highly capable team, uh, when employees are independent and responsible for maintaining control of their own work, um, close monitoring of a decision isn't needed, uh, and there's really full trust and confidence in the team members. But there are some limitations. Uh, first off, it's not suitable for lesser experienced employees. Even if you have a very experienced team, somebody coming on, a new employee coming onto the team, uh, you may want to make sure that you're a little more hands-on until you feel that, until they're confident in their role and you're confident in their abilities. Um, it can it can produce a lack of motivation because sometimes people really aren't motivated unless they are given more direction and more support. Um, and for some people, it can mean poor productivity if they're not uh, self-motivated and self-starters. All right, so before we go into the 10 common mistakes, um, any questions on management style? Just uh, well, Sherry, um, this is Rick. Yeah. So, Anyway, I, I came out of corporate America, you know, a bunch of years ago and, yep. you know, had 500 employees and I was at the top of, of, of that pyramid. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, actually, as I look back on it now, it was much simpler than managing a small organization of a half a dozen people. Mm -hmm. And 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 you may be getting to this into common mistakes, but, you know, what I'm experiencing now as I, as you are refreshing me on three different styles of management, the necessity lately for me to use different styles for different employees. And, and I think with the current labor pool, you know, maybe we're going to be experiencing more and more of that. If we can't fully staff at people who are highly motivated uh, to take, you know, a, a hundred percent interest in their jobs, um, so anyway, I'd like to hear your comment about that. Yeah, no, and, and I and I and I feel your pain. I'll tell you, I was talking with a client this morning, my first call of the morning. Um, brand new employee, it's a glass company. Brand new employee, they hired on third uh, on Thursday. Monday, they text and say can't come in, have to have an emergency, and they send a picture of some growth on their neck. And then the next day, they can't come in because now the growth is being removed. And I mean, it just went on and on. I, I, I've i never, heard, it, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Um, and you are in a particular industry that got hit very hard by COVID. And then as you're coming, and then a lot of the people who were in that industry, very much like hospitality, um, people who were in that industry said, oh boy, you know, this isn't as stable as I'd like it to be. And they moved on to other industries. So sometimes it's a matter of um, kind of what you're talking about, Rick, is is uh, before maybe you were a little bit more hands off and let people maybe do their own scheduling or do, you know, do their own thing. But maybe now you're not hiring that level of employee. So you have to kind of pivot your management style a little bit. Um, but I, I'll tell you, I come out of a retail background before I got into HR. I was in retail for 18 years. Um, I was a district manager in, for KB Toys when I left. And I will tell you that my motto was a warm body is not better than no body at all. Agreed. It, you know, <laughs> it, it is. I know it is so easy to just say, oh, my God, they walk, they talk, they can chew gum at the same time. 
put him in a vehicle and let him go. But um, the problem with that is, is obviously if they are not um, able to do the job well, it really reflects on your organization terribly. And it causes you so much headache that it's more work than if you didn't have anybody there at all. So there is, I, I'm really trying to encourage employers to not drop their standards um, just because the uh, employees seem to have the upper hand right at the moment. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the workforce more years than I'd like to count. And what's happening now, I mean, the, the economy and what's happening in the country, it's very cyclical. Um, and it is likely that, you know, we, if this inflation continues, we are going to start to see employers starting to pull back, which means that you're going to have more people out in the, in the job market instead of those people who are just applying just to maybe satisfy their unemployment requirement or, or something like that. So um, I, I just want to say this too shall pass. So don't give up hope. All right. So let's talk about the 10 common mistakes uh, that, uh, especially again, this transition from uh, to management is really, it's, it's a new type of role that requires a whole new skill set. Um, so as you assume a new role, this role, you have to be on the lookout for some of these mistakes. First is over-supervising. Uh, sometimes micromanaging can really alienate employees and make them feel like you don't trust them to get the job done. Um, it's better to establish some specific check-in times to make sure an assignment's on track and uh, in order to give the employee some autonomy. So you need to sort of balance that out. Now, on the flip side of that is maybe being too hands-off. Some people start a new job as, uh, in management and don't want to seem too bossy. Uh, they don't want to seem too overpowering. Um, but, you know, and, and due to a lack of experience, it's really due to a lack of experience or fear of appearing bossy. But you want to give employees sufficient authority, autonomy, and resources based on their skill levels and their experience. You want to remember that some employees are going to need more structure than others to succeed. So going totally hands off uh, may also be uh, a mistake. Uh, number three is trying to change everything right away. Uh, for those of you who are, who was it? Um, one of, we've been in the role for three months now. Who is that? That was um, Ron, right? So Ron, you might find that whoever said predecessor was, you know, some of the things they were doing, you're wondering, why did they do that? I don't even understand why this process is in place. Um, and sometimes even just questioning that can rub people the wrong way and actually increase the, but that's the way we've always done it kind of syndrome. Um, you want to take the time to make sure you're getting team consensus when you can. So it, it does, I mean, you do want to understand, you know, why th people do things a certain way, but in Asking that, you want to make sure you're not asking it, you're asking it in a way to really inform yourself, not really challenge how they're doing it. It's definitely a balancing act there. All right, number four, sharing confidential information. So again, when you, especially when you come from in-house and you are not in a supervisory role and you're you know friends with a lot of your coworkers and then all of a sudden now you're in a in a supervisory role or management role and you have access to confidential information you really want to be careful that you're not going to share that information with other people who really shouldn't be in the know um and you want to be careful not to share that information with anybody either at home or at work so it can be very, very challenging. I know for us, I'll tell you, like, like my call this morning, there are days that, boy, we can't believe some of the stuff we run into with clients and with some of their employees. And you want to share those stories because they're funny uh, or, or they're just, you can ex explain how your day has gone, but you want to watch that, that confidential information and make sure you're not sharing that. All right, this is one of my favorites, blaming upper management for unpopular decisions. So sometimes it's really easy to, you know, see face with employees and say, you know what, I don't, I, it's upper management's decision. I don't, I don't think this is, I don't think it's a good idea either. Well, guess what? Upper management made the decision. It's up to you as a manager to, to, to make sure those decisions or those processes or, or procedures are implemented. 
Um, so even if you disagree with a policy, you want to talk to your manager about those concerns privately. You don't want to let your employees know. Um, and you want to explain policies clearly so employees understand why they're being introduced, uh, even if they don't agree with them. Um, you know, again, a lot of things changed with COVID. Um, and again, especially in your industry, you know, an employee might say, hey, listen, I don't need to wear a mask anymore because the CDC says I don't have to. But you might make a decision that for the safety of your employees and the safety of your, your customers that you want them to wear masks. So you want to explain why. Um, sometimes that helps them understand, uh, you know, maybe understanding that it puts a customer at ease. Um, I know I just got done. I just got back uh, from Guatemala with my daughter and uh, we had we we had uh, people um, chauffeuring us around uh, the entire week. And I was really I was really pleased to see that they all had masks on. It was a requirement um, for them to have masks on. And for me, that put me at ease because here I am traveling in a foreign country and I just didn't want to expose myself to anything. Uh, so it just as a customer put me at ease. So if employees understand that, it, it helps. But if if you aren't happy with the decision in management's, upper management's making, you need to take it to upper management, not to your employees. All right. Providing preferential treatment. Um, so again, when you get promoted from within, um, if you have some employees that you feel uh, that you're you're were friends with, uh, and now you are their manager, it gets a little awkward. And if you have some employees that you feel more positive about, um, it, you really want to make sure that's not evident to other employees. I mean. One of the things about being promoted from within is you've got the inside intel, right? You know, having worked with those employees as, as your peers, you know their strengths and weaknesses, you know their attitudes towards the job, towards the company, towards their customers. So you really can use that information, but you also want to make sure that you don't um, give people who you are confident with preferential treatment that you're not giving to everybody else because other people will notice that. Um, and then with people who you are friends with outside of work, who you are now managing, establish those expectations right from the get-go. You know, to sit them down and say, listen, I'm in a new role. You and I have a new work relationship, which has nothing to do with our outside relationship, but inside of work, you know, I have to, I have to be a manager and I, and your support's going to mean the world to me you know, and, and hope that they will do that. All right, um, another issue is focusing on the details rather than the goals. So first time managers really have to learn to shift their focus, like I said, um, from, from being an individual contributor to actually managing the team. So you really need to focus on the big picture. So as, uh, as an employee, you're only responsible for accomplishing your own individual tasks. You may not have to be aware of how your department was functioning as a whole. Uh, so you need to learn to monitor the team members' progress efficiently to keep the entire team on course towards achieving goals. Um, especially, again, in this environment, we're having trouble staffing. Uh, as a manager, you may be pulling double duty. So some of the time you're managing and some of the time you are driving. And it, it is still important to make sure that even if you have to focus on the details when you are um, when you are uh, driving, you need to make sure that you're focusing on the larger goals in the bigger picture. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure you're staying on course. All right. Next common mistake is not providing feedback. Employees shouldn't be hearing about their performance issues for the first time during their annual review. Uh, you should give them both positive and constructive feedback as it occurs. Um, and again, um, you know, because of the staffing issues that you're running into, a lot of times employers don't want to say anything. They don't want to criticize. They don't want to um, risk losing somebody. So they don't give that feedback. But by not giving the feedback, you're not giving the employee a chance to improve their performance. Um, you, you're really depriving them of that opportunity. So when you when you think about especially having to give that constructive feedback, we don't like to call it negative. We like to call it constructive. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you're giving it in such a way that they understand that you're really trying to help them improve their performance. 
Um, and you want to make sure you're taking time for that positive feedback as well. Um, you're hearing from a customer, you know, if you, if you ask customers for feedback after a, um, after a, uh, a trip, you know, you want to share all that good stuff. Uh, sharing it uh, publicly is a great way to do that. You know, uh, every Friday morning at, at, at MP, we have a, an all company meeting at 8, 845. And uh, one of the things our management team, our leadership team does is they call out what we call um, our, our uh, heroes, our heroes for the week. And, you know, just anybody who maybe we've gotten a, an email from a client or maybe a coworker uh, gave a shout out to a fellow uh, employee or teammate um, because of uh, what they, you know, how they've helped them out. Um, we share that feedback. So, you know, consider doing that as well. All right. And failing to delegate, and we're going to delve much more into this, but a manager's job is to get the work done through others, not to do the job yourself. Uh, so failing to delegate really leaves you little time for the strategic planning and organizing uh, that you should be doing. And again, we're going to delve a lot more into that. And then finally, being pro reactive rather than proactive. Um, I'll tell you again, when COVID hit, we that March of 2020, um, we left the office on a Friday, said, see you Monday, right? And didn't see each other for months and months and months after until months and months afterwards. I've been sitting in the same room now for two and a half years, about to lose my mind. Um, we had to be very reactionary about a lot of things. The situation made it such. But if you constantly find yourself being reactive rather than proactive, it's taking a step back and figuring out why you're constantly being reactive. So if you're constantly having people calling out, for example, and you're having a problem staffing shifts, staffing, you know, getting, getting your uh, customers where they need to go, um, then it's really important to take a look at maybe your hiring practices um, and making sure uh, that you're doing some good hiring to avoid those problems. That's being proactive rather than reactive. Um, it can be really destructive when it becomes the norm for your team, when they're constantly putting out fires and they're constantly reacting to situations um, in, in a, you know, having to jump on things. It really can demotivate people. All right. So before we move on to learning to delegate, uh, questions, comments? Nope. Okay. Um, hang on, I want to, let me, I need to uh, make sure the sound is working on here. Here we go, share sound. All right. So like I said, learning to de delegate is really one of the most important things to do. And even for an experienced manager, there's a lot of times that we don't always do the delegation we should. Because honestly, really mastering de de uh, the ability to delegate, there's a lot of upfront, upfront time and effort into that. And sometimes it's just easier to do the job yourself, but it isn't helping your employees and it's not helping yourself. So I just want to share this video with you. Let me see if it's going to run. Can you hear the sound? I think so. Hey, John. Uh, are you finished with that project analysis report? I stopped by Jeremy's desk. He said you're still working on it. Finishing it right now. Uh, it would have taken too long to get Jeremy up to speed on this project, so uh, I decided to do it myself. I should have it ready for you in about the next hour. <sighs> okay. Look, we just need to buy close of business so that we can review it before the client meeting at 8 a.m. tomorrow. I know, I know. It'll be ready. Don't worry. Hey, John, Mr. Fujiyama's on the line for the third time today. He said he really needs to talk to you. Can I forward him to Marie? She is the lead on his project. No, Teresa, I really need to handle Mr. Fujiyama myself. He's a very important client. Tell him I'll call him back in one hour. Okay. Hey, John, you ready to go to lunch? I don't have time for lunch today. I am too busy. I know we were going to discuss the meeting with the IBT group tomorrow, but... It's okay. I already put talking points together. You want to see them? No. Actually, I think you should use mine. I wrote these down in a Starbucks line. Use these. Sorry, I wasn't able to text them to you on the phone, but I was talking with a client. 
Okay. John. 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 Oh, oh, um, sorry, I was just resting my eyes. What time is it? Oh, no. Oh, no. It can't be three already. What am I gonna do? John, calm down. What's going on here? Well, I was up late last night working on these projects, and I guess I just fell asleep. I can't believe this. I try as hard as I can, but I, I just can't seem to keep up. And I feel like I've only had about two hours sleep since I, I got promoted a month ago. Oh no, and I still have to call Mr. Fujiyama back. John, come into my office and we'll discuss this further. Well, no, no, really, I can explain everything, please. I mean, I know you hired me because I'm the guy that gets things done. I, I still am that guy. I just need some okay, time. I just okay, get... take a deep breath and come into my office. We need to talk about delegation. So, did that sound familiar to anybody or look familiar to anybody? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a lot of this. I, I, this is my experience in retail really sort of um, taught me a lot about learning to delegate because, especially as I became a district manager and I was managing, you know, 10 stores in four different time zones. Uh, doing it all myself was not feasible. So learning how to delegate was so critically important. So uh, learning to delegate, delegation is really a win-win when it's done appropriately. Um, it allows you to make the best use of your time and your skills, and it also helps others in the team grow and develop. So it sounds great. So why don't people, why don't managers delegate? Like I said before, it's easier to do it yourself. You know the task inside out, and it does take a lot of upfront effort, but that effort is so important. Um, scheduling comes to mind for me because, um, again, coming out of retail, probably what you you are all experiencing, um, scheduling is um, really challenging when there's so many uh, so many factors that affect what how much staff that you need and where that staff needs to be. Um, but if you are not allowing your managers, people who report to you or your supervisors to learn that skill, you're depriving them of that developing themselves. And you're also um, taking on a task that somebody else might be able to do that frees you up to do what's more important. So uh, it's often a scary prospect to think about letting uh, someone else take over a task um, for uh, when you've been doing it for a while you've got to ask yourself questions like, what if they don't do it correctly? Or what if the outcome is not up to my standards? Or what if they don't do it the, the way it's I've been doing it? Or what if I become less essential to the business? Or gasp, what if they do it better than me? Uh, so it's really tempting to hold on to control sometimes. And giving up that control is often, but wrongly, equated with giving up leadership as well. But in fact, leadership has much, much more to do with responsibility than authority or control. I'll just tell you a quick story about um, years ago, I worked for a manufacturer and I, I ran their retail stores and I would go to outlet centers all over the country to open new stores. So I was in Boaz, Alabama, which is a bump on a mountain in, in the northern part of Al Alabama. And I was bringing in two to three trailer loads of merchandise a day. So I had 50 temporary employees that were helping to unload and stock the shelves and all of that. So I had one guy ask me, he said he was supposed to be putting together this four foot section of sweaters and the sweaters came in four colors. So he said, what am I supposed to do with these? I said, I want you to, uh, I want you to stripe them down I, and you want to do white, green, blue, and red. And he says, okay, well, I didn't go back to follow up to see if he understood my instructions. He stopped by and said, Sherry, we have a lot more white and not enough green. Um, and I said, oh, well, you know what? Just pick up the green and put the white underneath. 
And again, I didn't follow up to make sure he knew what I meant. And when I went back to see what when his, when the job was done, he had in each little cubby there were two green sweaters and a white sweater, and then two green sweaters and a white sweater, and then two green sweaters and a white sweater, which was totally not what I was explaining to him. But I started to laugh because I said, it, it's not your fault. It's mine. You did exactly what I told you. What I meant was I want you to put the green in the top few cubbies and then put the white on the bottom cubbies. But I didn't say that, nor did I go back to make sure that the task I delegated was being done correctly. Um, so that was a, a, a good lesson for me. And it was also, um, it, it, it it really frustrates your employees when they have to redo things because you haven't taken the time to make sure they understand things fully. So to delegate effectively, you wanna set yourself and your employees up for success and you need to choose the right task to delegate, identify the right people to delegate it to and delegate it in the right way. You will achieve so much more once you're delegating effectively. All right, so when to delegate. So to determine when delegation is most appropriate, you want to ask yourself, is there someone else that has the necessary information or expertise to complete the task? Does the task provide an opportunity to grow and develop for an another person's skills? Uh, is this a task that will recur in a similar form in the future? If that's if it's a task that's only done once in a while, it may not be worth your time to delegate. Um, but if it's something that's done on a weekly basis or monthly basis on an ongoing basis, it might be. And do you have enough time to delegate the job effectively? So if you can answer yes to at least some of these questions, then it could really be worth your while to delegate the job. So factors you want to consider is uh, the experience, knowledge, and skill of the individual you're thinking about delegating to in their current workload. You don't want to delegate to somebody whose plate is already overflowing. And then how do you delegate? Um, I'm a big proponent of beginning with the end in mind and, and specifying the desired result. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter how the job gets done as it, long as it gets done the way it's supposed to. Um, uh, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, my, my, my daughter, when, it, uh, <laughs> I have, when she clears the table from dinner, she will take her place setting, go into the kitchen, put it in the sink, come back and get mine, put it in the sink. We have company, she'll get theirs, but one at a time. Now, in my brain, that's not a very efficient way to do that. I'm going to stack them all up and carry as much as I can at one time. That's just my method. But what's the what's the goal in this in this case? To get the table cleared and get the dishes in the sink. So does it really matter how she does it? Not so much. I know that's a very basic analogy, but... Um, it, it really is important that somebody understand if you're giving them steps to do what the end result is, because if they're in the middle of it and something doesn't make sense to them or they don't know that it really is going to get to the desired result, they'll, you're giving them the power to kind of question that. If you don't tell them what the end result is supposed to be, they don't have the benefit of that, of that knowledge. Um, you want to clearly identify constraints and boundaries. Um, and what I mean by that is you want to say, okay, um, you know, I need you to do X, Y, Z, but if uh, you need to make any adjustments, um, I need you to, you know, come back and let me know what, what needs to change. Um, and then you also want to match the amount of responsibility with the amount of authority. So if you're giving a manager response, or I'm sorry, um, a subordinate, uh, uh, responsibility to you delegating a task to them and it involves them, let's say, uh, getting information or training uh, a new employee or some, some of your existing employees, um, but they don't have the authority. You're not, you, you don't let people know that they have this authority, then it's, it, they're, they're going to really run into some issues. Again, back in my retail days, oftentimes I'd have an assistant manager who thought they were ready to be a manager. Um, and when we would have an opening, they would want to, to jump into that role. So I would give them a delegation day. And what I would do is I'd say, okay, I'd let the team know what was going on. And I'd say, okay, here are some things I need you to get done today. But the trick is, is that you cannot do any of these things yourself. You must delegate these tasks. And I always let the team know so that they don't think that there's somebody, you know, um, 
doing something that they're not supposed to be. Um, and it really is, it's it's a challenge for people to, to learn how to do that, but it gives them that opportunity to uh, kind of grow with that. So learning to delegate, you want to understand that you can delegate some of the responsibility, but you can't delegate away the, uh, the ultimate accountability. So if it is your responsibility to get something done and you delegate it to somebody, really want to make sure that you're following up and make sure it's getting done properly. So you want to establish and maintain control and then provide adequate support and be available to answer questions. All right, and then finally, you want to discuss the timelines and deadlines. The goal is to help make some of take some of the work off your plate and help an employee be successful at taking on additional responsibilities. So you want to agree on a schedule of checkpoints at which you're going to review project progress. Um, again, that way they're not assuming maybe you're they they don't feel like you don't trust them because you've already established this ahead of time. We're going to touch base at the end of each week to make sure where we are in this process um, and make adjustments where necessary. So many of the tasks that we have to do as managers uh, are dependent on other people in or outside the organization doing their role uh, or their piece of the uh, their piece of the puzzle. So sometimes you have to make adjustments. Um, and, and, um, and, and so you want to make sure you're flexible with that. Um, and then always take time to review all the submitted work to make sure that it is, um, that it's accurate. Cause again, you cannot, you're still ultimately responsible. All right. So before we go on to the next section, how about questions or comments? Ooh, very quiet group. Okay, well, let's talk about managing your former peers. Um, it can be a little bit tricky. And then for those of you in, in a management role currently, as you promote somebody from within, maybe going from an individual contributor to a supervisory role, you wanna make sure that you keep in mind uh, that you need to help them with this part of that transition, managing their former peers because it can be very tricky. tricky. And if you're friends with people outside of work, uh, you're going to have to manage that shift in the relationship. So with a tactful approach, setting new boundaries and altering your own behavior, you can become a successful leader um, uh, you know, among your peers. But unfortunately, managers who continue to socialize with their former peers, especially a select few of their former peers, tend to run into problems down the road. So problems you might face, uh, former peers who don't think they have to follow the rules. Um, maybe it's a, if the uh, manager socializes with some of the employees, but not others, but not all, the others may feel that there's favoritism. So you need to be watching out for that. Um, a former peer who feels that they are, they deserve the promotion and may attempt to sabotage you in your new role. Um, or if one of the peers resents your promotion, it can really mean attitude problems. So how do you address some of these things? Well, counteracting these potential problems, you want to ask your current manager to meet with the team to make the announcement. You shouldn't show up and say, hey, gang, I'm the manager today. Hopefully, your, your supervisor or your manager is letting the, letting the team know that. And then meet with each person to discuss their goals and interests. And then if someone's demonstrating disappointment or resentment, Give the person some time to come to terms with their own emotions. I'm a big fan of calling out the elephant in the middle of the room. Um, you know, you sit that person down and say, you know what? I understand that you're disappointed that you did not get this promotion or you may resent, you know, me being in this role. And I, I want you to understand that I get it. And I, I, I do appreciate your, your, your feelings about that. And I just want us to be able to work well together. Um, you know, so you know, call it out. Don't, don't try to ignore it because if somebody's resentful, it's not going to go away. It's just going to continue to fester. Um, so um, I'm a, again, big fan of doing one-on-ones. It's a great way to clear the air. Um, so you want to ask good questions and get their opinions. Um, take on the awkwardness, like I say, calling out the elephant in the room. Uh, and that sends a strong message on how you face challenges and value their input. 
Um, and it's also a great way to build your new manager slash your new manager team member relationship with them. Um, use your previous role to your advantage. Like I said, you know the strengths and weaknesses and you can set people up for success that way. Um, delegate work that you know they can do well and then give them the trust and autonomy to do it. Um, and then it, this can help melt away resentment feelings if they know that you have their interests at heart. Um, when I got hired at KB Toys as the district manager, one of the managers in the stores really thought he was the one who should have gotten that role. Uh, and it was a very, very contentious situation at first. Uh, but what I learned to do was to, first off, kind of, again, call the elephant in the middle of the, point out the elephant in the middle of the room and say, you know what, I, I am aware that you wanted this position. Um, and my goal is to help you get to that level if that is what you want. Um, and then I learned what his strengths were and I used them to my advantage because honestly, when I started working in toys, I knew nothing about toys. I had come from Walden Books. I knew nothing about toys um, and I didn't know how to merchandise toys. It, this was his um, forte. So I had him going around the district, training people on merchandising anytime we got a new product line in or a seasonal change. Um, and that did a couple of things. First off, it, it really gave him some visibility to senior management that he didn't have before. And it also gave him um, the opportunity to learn how to balance out. Because uh, when you're working as a district manager, it's really hard to sort of juggle everything and be on top of everything. But it really gave him that experience. Um, and very proud to say when I left the company, he was the person who got promoted into my role. So um, and it, it really can help. All right, so uh, helpful tips for managing former peers. Start weaning yourself off of lunches, outings, you know, going out for drinks after work. Um, it really makes it difficult to, to maintain those boundaries. Um, embrace your new peer group. So maybe you don't have a peer group because some of your businesses might be small. Maybe you don't have other management people at your level. Um, so maybe take advantage of like this, this livery association and other, other people in similar situations that you can run things by. Um, rethink your social media settings. Um, honestly, you don't need people who are reporting to you, um, you know, to know what you're doing, you know, off, you know, off the clock, um, nor do nor should you know what they're doing off the clock. It really can create a lot of problems. Um, be clear about your expectations for performance and tell the team what you what to expect from you, and that can really be helpful. All right, one more section: tips for new managers. Uh, any questions or comments? We're doing on time. Oh, we're doing good. All right, so, so a few tips for new managers. Um, accept that you have a lot to learn. You wanna really be prepared to learn from others, um, including your new team. And then find a mentor. A mentor can really provide invaluable advice and guidance in your new role. And it doesn't need to be a mentor within your own organization. It can be a mentor outside your organization as well. Communicate clearly. Always keep your team fully informed of project goals, priorities, and important deadlines. It really helps when people understand what their job, um, how their job interacts in, and helps to achieve the goal of the department or the organization. And then provide clear direction like we talked about and always welcome questions and feedback. Um, Provide timely feedback. You want to be consistent in your feedback and discuss performance. When you're discussing performance, delegate. We've already talked about how, which helps you to manage your own responsibilities and tasks better. And it also builds your team skills and boosts their confidence. Uh, set a good example. You want to walk the walk, not just talk the duck. Um, if you want to shape team behavior, improve performance, and build good habits, you need to lead by example. If you want people to um, uh, uh, speak politely to their teammates, then you need to speak politely to your team. You need to lead by example. 
uh, oh, provide team with feedback. We already have that. Um, encourage feedback. Some employees are unwilling to speak up unless they're prompted. So if you if you're having say, let's say you're having a team meeting and you have a few quiet people in there, um, pull them aside afterwards and say, hey, listen, you know, I, I think maybe you are uncomfortable maybe talking in front of the group. So I just wanted to get your feedback on what we talked about. Uh, maintain an open door policy so your team knows you are willing to listen. And when I say open door policy, I mean literally leave the door open because when you have your, when you're in the office with the door shut, that says don't bother me. Generally, to people, um, not to all people. Some people don't don't get that message, but um, you want to make sure that people know that you are really willing to listen. All right. Offer recognition, talked a little bit about this before, but recognize the team efforts and achievements uh, and as well as individuals uh, efforts and achievements. Um, it builds confidence and it really encourages those that future contribution. And then again, like I said, help the team see the big peach and picture. How do their assignments and projects fit into the company's larger goals? Create an environment of learning. Encourage your team to explore new methods for reaching goals. Allow them to make and learn from their own mistakes. Uh, sometimes when you jump in and just do it for them, um, they don't learn how to get themselves out of a situation. Um, and be patient with yourself. Developing strong managerial skills takes time. We all learn on, uh, on an ongoing basis, um, especially though as you're adjusting to a new position. Uh, so uh, these are just some management books that I've referred people to over the years. Uh, they are all tried and true. Um, and if you haven't read them, they're all really, really good reads and can really help you build um, your management skills. And then we do offer a number of management trainings. I know that we've already done a couple for you, and I think there's some others coming up. So, um, you know, let the organization know. I'm not sure who it is you should let know. Um, but let them know if there's other topics that are of interest that you'd like us to um, to do for you. So with that, I'm going to, oops, no, I'm going to stop my share. And let's see. All right. So um, any questions, comments, anything that came up that you want to uh, understand more about? Oh. Crickets. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time today, giving you five minutes back in your day. And like I said, we're going to send out a copy of the recording um, and then we will send out a copy of the slide deck and that management um, uh, management style survey. Sherry, a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Take care. All right. Thanks, Sergio. Bye bye. Thank Ron. you very much. Have a nice afternoon. You too. Bye bye. bye.